All right, so the next three chapters, 19, 20, and 21, are all regarding the same system, the cardiovascular system. Chapter 19 focuses on the blood, chapter 20 focuses on the heart, and chapter 21 is the arteries and the veins. So that you know the next kind of unit, the next unit, unit two, is going to be focused on one system and how that system works. So let's start with 19, um, the blood. Again, outline of the chapter, quick outline of the chapter. The thing you have to understand about the cardiovascular system is every cell in your body is a living cell, meaning that it needs constant nutrition and it needs constant waste removal because as a living cell, it's going to be metabolically active. It needs to have nutrients and at the same time, it needs to be able to get rid of waste. Um, the system, the cardiovascular system, is made up of your heart, which is the pump that helps to move everything, the blood vessels, which are going to be the highways that allow things to move from one area to another, and the blood, which is the transport or the transporter, because it's the one that actually moves things from point A to point B using those blood vessels as a highway system. That um, connection helps to basically connect various tissues of the body, allowing the blood to pick up nutrients at the intestine and drop them off in the tissues, let's say in your leg or in your toes. The heart pumps the blood through the blood vessels. Like I said, the blood delivers nutrients and picks up waste products. It can also pick up other things, but for simplicity's sake, that's what that, that's kind of the big thing. So this figure that you are seeing over here is actually the figure from chapter one that gives kind of the simplistic explanation of what this system does for us. So let's talk blood. Um, blood is a type of connective tissue. You learn that way back in chapter four um, when we talked about the different types of tissues and one of them was connective tissue and in that or in that category, I guess, yeah, that's the right way to say that. Um, blood was one of those types of tissues. Um, it's made up of two primary parts. The formed elements, which make up about 45%, are going to be cells and cell fragments. Now, cell fragments is literally chunks of cell, okay? So I don't want you to think that that's like a protein or a hormone or something like that. It's actually a piece of the cell that has been torn off. And you'll see that in just a minute. And then you've got the matrix, which is actually the plasma. 55% of your blood's volume is plasma. And it's the only connective tissue that has a liquid matrix. As far as blood volumes go, um, Females have about four to five liters on average. Males have about five to six liters on average. Again, this is an average. And the reason that I'm pointing that out is because most of the time, again, not always, females are going to be smaller than males. So what that means is they're going to have less blood volume. They have less room to put it, basically. Um, it does make up 8% of your total body weight as well. So the functions of the blood, the functions of the blood, the functions of the blood. Blood actually has quite a few functions. It does transport gases, nutrients, and waste products, as we mentioned in our kind of simple slide, but it also transports process molecules, regulatory molecules. It helps with the regulation of our blood's pH and osmosis, which is the water balance. Um, it helps us to maintain our body temperature. Um, it's involved in protection against foreign substances, as well as clot formation. So let's get into a little bit more detail here. Transport of gases, nutrients, and waste products. So the gases we're talking about primarily are going to be oxygen and carbon dioxide. Oxygen which is O2, um, gets picked up at the lungs and then gets transported to the cells. CO2 
is a waste product that the cells make that gets picked up in the tissues of the body as a waste product and then gets transported to the lungs so that we can go and get rid of it as a waste product. Ingested nutrients, ions, and water. So we eat food for a reason, right? I mean, we don't just eat food to eat food, although some of us, aka me, do. Um, but ultimately, the reasoning behind us doing that, the purpose for us doing that, is so that we can get the nutrients out of the food and have fuel for our body to function, right? So this all happens in the digestive system. But the thing I think people forget about is it's not only about the nutrients. We also ingest ions like salt. So sodium and chloride and magnesium and calcium, as well as absorbing the water out of whatever we're consuming, whether that is an actual food product or whether that is a bottle of water. Um, the digestive system is designed for us to consume it and then we absorb it and transport it where it needs to go using our blood. Waste products. Okay, so again, our cells are metabolically active. Anything that is living is going to create waste. So we can't just leave it there. That would be like saying, you know, oh yeah, I've got garbage in my house, but I just leave it there. I don't actually put it anywhere else. Yeah, no, let's not become hoarders, okay? <laughs> let's go on ahead and get rid of that. So what do we do? We put it on the curb on the street that we live on so that a garbage truck can come pick it up and take it away. Well, if you think about the cells as kind of putting their waste on the curb, the blood is the one that picks it up and takes it to wherever that final destination is going to be. So it is a huge transport system when it comes down to it. Okay, transporting processed molecules. Many things are made in one place in the body and then they get carried by the blood to another part for either modification or even finalization. Sometimes it gets picked up, taken one place for modification, gets picked up and gets taken to a third place for finalization. So the best example of this is going to be vitamin D. So in AMP1, you should have learned that in chapter five, the integumentary system, the skin, makes vitamin D, but it makes kind of a preform of active vitamin D, right? Well, that actually gets transferred to the liver and the kidney. The liver and the kidney modify it so that it actually becomes an active form of vitamin D. Now, this is kind of the other interesting part about this. That active form of vitamin D doesn't necessarily work in the liver. Um, it does work um, in the kidney, but it also works in the small intestine and it works in the bone. Okay, so it has three jobs. I get finalized in one place, but now I have to go to my final spot where I actually work. So what's the whole point of having active vitamin D? To promote calcium uptake. Going back to AMP1, again, remember that calcium is needed for neurons to work. Remember that calcium is needed for muscle to work. So calcium is really important. And if we don't have the right homeostatic amount of calcium, if we don't have the right balance of calcium, then our bodies will start to shut down. So it goes to the kidney. And if there's urine being made, it basically says, hey, so is there any calcium in that urine? If the kidneys go, yeah, there is. It'll go, yeah, bring that back, reabsorb that. So it starts pulling this calcium back into the blood. It goes to the intestine and it says, hey, that food that they just ingested, is there any calcium in that? And if, again, the intestine says, yeah, there is, it'll say, yeah, absorb that. Again, bringing calcium back into the blood. Both of these functions or both of these uh, events is going to, or are going to, because it's events, that's plural, 
both of these events are going to increase the amount of calcium in our bloodstream. Now, the final place that it actually goes, which is not here, but it happens, is to the bone. The bone also has the ability to break down matrix and create um, free calcium to go into the blood. All three of these end up with more calcium in the blood. Now, the whole point of all of that explanation is it's a processed molecule that is being carted around by the blood. It gets made in one place, carted to the blood to a second location to get changed, carted by the blood to get to a final location to function. It's a processed molecule, okay? Now, the third function, transport of regulatory molecules. This is what we just talked about forever, for two whole chapters in the first unit. Hormones. Hormones regulate processes in your body, as you already know. So, your blood is responsible for transporting oxytocin from your anterior, or I'm sorry, your posterior pituitary down to your uterus so that it'll cause uterine contractions. Your blood is responsible for transporting insulin from your pancreas to the cells in your body so that they can start absorbing glucose. These are regulating processes in your body. So it carries hormones. It can also carry enzymes, which also help to regulate certain things in your body. But no matter what, they are regulatory molecules. Now, regulation of pH and osmosis. Your blood's pH has a very narrow homeostatic window. It has to be between 7.35 and 7.45. That's as different as you can get without basically getting out of your homeostatic window. So within your blood, we have buffers. Again, going back to AMP1, chapter two, chapter two, the chemistry chapter. Buffers are chemicals that can either absorb hydrogen ions or release hydrogen ions to keep the pH stable in my bloodstream. So we have buffers in our bloodstream that help us to maintain that pH in the body. Now, osmotic composition, remember osmosis is water, right? We're talking about water. Blood is critical for maintaining normal fluid and ion balance in the body. So it's, it's, well, one of its functions is to help us to maintain that balance of water versus ions in our blood. Five, maintenance of body temperature. Um, again, if we go back to the integumentary system, we kind of touched on it before. Warm blood, if our body is very, very warm, will actually get transported from the core of our body out to the surface. That's why when you are very, very warm, your skin flushes and you get red because we're transferring that blood out to the surface of your body. Now you're probably going, okay, why, why, why do we do that? Well, think about it this way. What's the coolest part of your body? The coolest part of your body is going to be the surface. So when the blood goes out into the skin, and it's going through those little capillary beds that are right below the skin, it's actually cooling off. Yeah, it's not cooling off by like 30 degrees or anything, but it's cooling off enough that when it kind of works its way back around and circulates, it's going to bring a cooler temperature back to the core of your body. It's a way to release heat from your body, okay? And that is the blood doing that. Protection against foreign substances. Your blood is a very important part of your immune system, okay? Um, at least a part of it is. You've got cells in there that help to fight foreign substances like toxins or even microorganisms that invade your body, white blood cells specifically that we will talk about in just a bit, but they actually do 
kind of form an army that helps us to fight. And then finally, the last function is clot formation. And I know you're probably going, okay, why is that important? Well, <laughs> if you didn't have the ability to do this, you'd bleed to death anytime you got a paper cut. So it protects against excessive blood loss. That's just my abbreviation for the word excessive. Okay. Excessive. Um, basically, if a blood vessel is damaged, it's going to start to leak. We need to be able to cut that leak off. We don't want just leaking going on or you're bleeding. Um, so blood clot formation is basically the first step in tissue repair. And then once we stop the bleeding, we can actually start fixing things like tissue damage and then eventually remake those connections. We rebuild those connections so that we restore blood flow. So the plasma. Plasma, the liquid matrix of our blood, is 91% water and 9% other. So what are the other things that we have? We have proteins, we have ions, we've got nutrients, we've got gases, and we've got waste. So it's primarily water, but a lot of things can dissolve in water. That's one of the reasons why we love it so much as a solvent. Um, we do call it a colloid, though. Now, remember back to AMP1, we talked about the different types of, of mixtures. One was a solution where everything is just kind of distributed bottom to top. I talked about tea and getting a sample of tea from the top of the pitcher, the middle of the pitcher, and the bottom of the pitcher, and it's always tea. Then we talked about a suspension, and the suspension was things that if you stop shaking it, they just fall out of solution. The classic pink medicine that you get when you've got a cold in your little and they give you antibiotics and you have to shake it and then take it, you put it back in the fridge and 20 minutes later, there's a clump at the bottom and liquid at the top. That's a suspension. A colloid is going to be something that's kind of in the middle of those two things. The things that are suspended in fluid will stay there for quite a bit longer, but if you give them enough time, eventually they will fall out of solution because they are too heavy just to stay there. Proteins are big and complex, okay? So they do have a tendency to fall out of solution. They do have a tendency to just fall, but... They're small enough that it actually takes time for that to happen. It's not instantaneous. So we call it a colloid because it would happen eventually. Now, why doesn't it happen to us? Well, it doesn't happen to us because your blood is continuously flowing. It's like mixing it up every time. Okay? Now, the proteins that I'm mentioning... Let's see, doo, doo, doo. the proteins I'm mentioning up here. Let's talk about those. Um, they're produced by the liver or the blood cells primarily. Um, you've got globulins, you've got albumins, and you've got fibrinogen, okay? We're gonna talk about them in more detail in just a second, but just to kind of cover, these are the main proteins that you have in your blood right here, okay? Albumins, globulins, fibrinogen. The ions that we see include sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, chloride, iron, phosphate, hydrogen ions, hydroxide ions, and um, the bicarbonate ion, which is actually one of those buffers I was talking about earlier. The nutrients that we have floating in our blood include things like vitamins, and then we've got our fuels glucose. We've got cholesterol and triglycerides, and we have amino acids. Don't forget that amino acids are the building blocks of proteins, okay? And I'm sure you've heard of triglycerides if you've ever had blood work done. Admitted, most of the time they call it triglycerols. What's your triglyceride level or your triglycerol level when they're doing blood work? 
Now the gases that we see, that includes oxygen, which I don't think is a big 411 to anybody on the planet, the carbon dioxide waste product that I was talking about. And we actually have nitrogen gas in our blood. Funny enough, we don't really do anything with it. It's inert. But because the world, the planet, Earth, has an atmosphere that is 70% nitrogen, it ends up in our body just by the process of the fact that it's so predominant, it's going to diffuse into our body. The waste products that we see include urea, uric acid, um, creatinine or creatine, depending on how you learned it, ammonia, salts, bilirubin, and lactic acid. Several of these are products of protein metabolism when we break down proteins. Um, one of them is specific to when our red blood cells get recycled, but all of them regardless are going to be waste products that we need to get rid of. And then finally, we've got the regulatory substances I was talking about earlier, either hormones or um, enzymes. There we go. Sorry, had a brain fart moment. <laughs>